Hi, I'm Jennifer Sylvester, and you, this is the 2020 Education Week, specifically on uh, the historical and cultural significance of powwows. And my guest I have is Jennifer Maness, who is a professor at Ryerson and the, and the Faculty of Arts. And um, I have her go more further into her role in a minute. And so this is gonna be a QA, Q and A um, um, video as, through Zoom, as you can see, we're in the midst of a pandemic and we're as the hearing to the um, social distancing. So we moved this interview to um, Zoom and uh, hopefully we'll try and make it as interesting as we can for you. So um, again, I don't know if I introduced myself, <laughs> really bad. I'm Jennifer Sylvester. I'm a PhD student at OISE at uh, the Studies for Education, uh, Ontario Institute for Studies in Education at the University of Toronto. And again, my guest is Jennifer Vaness. And maybe you can introduce yourself and oh, your role. Talk about your role. Miigwech, Jennifer. Ani wapishka migaze nandish nakaz pikwakagam ndonjiba migaze donungida. I am thrilled to be here today. Thank you, Jennifer, for asking me to to join part of the powwow week. So I'm a PhD candidate at York University, and I'm assistant professor of Indigenous Studies at Ryerson University. My area of research is um, powwow, dance and embodiment. It's also the connection that Anishinaabe people have with spirit as expressed through powwow dance and regalia. Oh, that's amazing. Because because I can see why they connected us because my intent um, research is specifically on powwows too. Oh. And, it, and it's gonna be um, geared towards pow, uh, institutional powwows and what they do for academic institutions and especially in this time of reconciliation and mm. this is more because uh sort of the work that just to give more background to my uh not have it be about me but this is so you understand where we are um just so mm. i i brought the i initiated bringing the powwow back to university of toronto so they when they had the first one in 2017 that was the first one they had in a long time, the first documented one. Mm -hmm. So um, so that was a big deal and it's sort of gone annually, since, except for this past year because due to the pandemic it was canceled. Oh. But um, uh, it's been every year since then. So it's a, I mean, I'm excited to hear, to have this interview with you because it's, it's really interesting and I'm, I'm excited to learn more mm -hmm. about your research and okay. hopefully we can build a rapport and maybe work together. <laughs> no, absolutely. And I think this is, this is great because maybe this will even work well for the interview too, because we're like back and back and forth and I, it, I don't have to be so much of a talking head. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so we can, can talk about, do you, have you looked at like powwow history and like how it, how it started? I'm, I'm starting that. So I've, I've done, I did an independent research this past summer and I did a lot of reading on, um, more specifically, most institution powwows. Well, I was actually raised in the States. Uh, my dad is from uh, Pequawknagong, which is, was formerly Golden Lake, uh, up near Ottawa, up, you know, closer to that way. And he joined the U.S. Navy and uh, moved to the States and met my mom in Milwaukee. So I grew up really removed from my family and from my culture because we were in Virginia. And um, the first time I saw Native people that I wasn't related to uh, in my very first powwow, I was 19. So uh, I was just, I remember being like, like very excited. And, but at the same time, I felt, felt a bit of a loss. Right, because all of this, this powwow, all, all the happenings, all of the, the this beauty and excitement and stuff should belong to me, but I didn't feel like I was part of it. Mm. So, um, uh, uh, Chris Pheasant, Iban, and Bob Goulet, and some of the other people that I interviewed um, through the course of my research had talked about powwow being a gateway, and uh, I, it really resonated with me because that that was true for. For me, because of the social aspect of powwow 
at the time, that's the way that I had a doorway into the culture. And through going to Pow Wow, I knew more of the community. I got to meet more people, um, even though they weren't like family. You know, I, I was in touch with, uh, you know, began to be in touch with the culture, and um, eventually started attending ceremonies and and you know really grew my traditional knowledge. But I think it's important for people to know that um, you know there's a that you don't have to be raised with the culture to reclaim it. I think that's an important thing that people need to hear because I find, I find that if they feel like that they shouldn't participate or get into it if they hadn't grown up with it. And I do find a lot of people who, especially those who were removed from their families due to the 60s scoop and all that and oh. our residential schools, they feel like they don't, they don't feel the that comfort to sort of gain access to that. And I think that's an important Absolutely. Everybody needs to hear. <laughs> uh, one of the things that, that um, you may find too in your, your research uh, that I found from, from teaching and also my own experience was that when students get to university, that seems to be when they're starting to explore who they are as people and to like really come into themselves. And I, it was my first year of university uh, when you know, when I uh, experienced powwow in September, and then um, I took a, uh, at the time it was like, it's Native American studies in, in the States. And actually how I learned to dance was, um, you know, I bopped into the uh, American Indian Center in Chicago, uh, like before Thanksgiving one day, and you know, it's just like very bright and naive. And I'm like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm Jennifer Manessa, I'm from, Canada and I want to dance, I want a fancy shawl dance, you know, and they kind of gave me the one of, you know, the, the once over, it's like, who are you, where are you from, you know, they didn't really recognize me as part of the community, and, you know, when I started taking classes, um, I had an instructor who gave me a copy of a copy of a copy of a VHS tape of Finding the Circle that had aired on, it was American Indian Dance Theater, the, and it had aired on TV and somebody recorded it with an old VHS machine. And then, you know, the, in those days you could like copy this VHS tape and it would get grainier and grainier with each, you know, Oh yeah. as that went. And that's how I learned to dance. I waited until the fancy shawl came on section and I would like rewind it and stop it. And I would watch their feet and where the, how their weight transferred and you know, how they held the, the shawls and stuff. And then I would go to powwows and dance. You know, and I had support at the um, Indian Center in Chicago to uh, some of the elders there, um, Joey Yoshida, and, Joy Yoshida Ivan and uh, Alberta King Ivan uh, really helped me out, you know, with making regalia and getting me started. So it's, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it was, was in the big city and, you know, about university time. So I think that, you know, relates to that's one aspect that may may relate to what you are looking um, at. Yeah. So. I've always admired people who, the dancers who dance, because I've never felt that, like, I don't know, the dance never called me, but I find it starting to call me now. Uh -huh. And even though I'm older in age, like I'm, I'm in my mid forties, but I'm out that then there's that thing where people think, am I too old to start? Am I, it's too late for me to start dancing. And then I remember asking my auntie, my auntie, she's like, no, it's never too late. You're never too old. You're never, you can always start dancing whenever it, it calls you when it's time to call you. And I'm like, that's an important thing. And I'm like, yeah, because I, I do feel the, the call, but I'm just not sure. Like, I wish I had done it when my knees were a bit younger, <laughs> but now that my knees are older, but I know there's other forms of dance that I can do in the powwow circle that that uh, that accommodate my my yeah. 44 year old knees <laughs> <laughs> yes i hear you i absolutely un understand that so. So, uh, so we uh so i want to get into the history aspect of uh um the historical aspect of uh, the interview so um maybe you can share with us what in your research, what has the, what, what what's the history of the contemporary powwows? 
Sure. Um, I, I am happy to share that. I think that the best way to introduce powwow and to, in, to kind of frame like worldview and why it's important um, is to introduce Brian Oteman. Um, and, and he can introduce himself. He is more. Um, he is probably the premier expert on indigenous, uh, on Anishinaabe Moen and, uh, uh, yep, okay. And so we'll start, start there. Uh, some of, like, when I first start, started looking at powwow, right, um, I was interested in like, in the language and the words and like what is held in the language, you know, for understanding and meaning. And just to kind of be cheeky, I looked up how Western definitions of powwow, right? So, um, uh, Britannica.com says, the term powwow derives from a curing ritual that originated with one of the Algonquian nations of the Northeast Indians. Uh, Library and Archives Canada says the term powwow comes from an Algonquin word that means medicine man or he who dreams. And um, powwow from uh, Collins English Dictionary talks about either a conference or meeting, um, also a magical ceremony of certain North American Indians usually accompanied by feasting and dancing. So I was feeling that these, that these were just lacking uh, depth. So um, we'll ask Brian to come explain more about uh, powwow and also Jingtamuk in the, in the language. Ani. Ani. <laughs> oh, let's go right into it. Okay. Baba Jen Adishna Kaz, Nanashkasta Dodem, Kichikane Bigzi B in the Dojiba. My uh, Ojibwe name is Baba J. My clan is the Hummingbird Clan. I come from Serpent River First Nation community. I uh, I can speak Ojibwe language. Uh, the proficiency of my language is uh, I've worked for the Prime Minister's office uh, as of last year. I did the federal debate for the federal candidates. I'm a translator simultaneous for the Nuclear Commission of Canada. That's just to give a background of what I can do. But traditionally, I've been teaching Ojibwe language for over 22 years. So, you know, well versed. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> so, to get into the question, I guess uh, I was following up to you guys' discussion there. You were talking about powwow, the origin of powwow, right? Yeah. So, the word powwow in Ojibwe comes from the word powwawagan. It describes a powwawagan, is a, the powwawagan by itself is a pipe, right? The powwawagan is the accentuation or the, or the depth of the smoke, or the kicking of the sand, the kicking of the smoke. Ceremonially, just like the bowl of the pipe, the arbor is the center of the burning flame that exists inside the pipe bowl. And the, the circle that is around it is just like the bowl pipe, right? So that's why you say powwow for abbreviated. Powa wa gun. So when you double emphasize the wa, you're, you're saying two circles, just like an egg. That's why you say the egg is wa one. <clears throat> so you're saying within the egg and the yolk of the egg of creation. And so you're dancing your ceremony of your own journey. Like we're all on our own journey. You know, that's why we can't judge one another, you know. So in each journey, powa wa gun, we kick the sand or we create the smoke and that ceremony is created. So the acknowledgements of the creator hears us. And the creator, you know, we're, we're the summary of who we are. We're all a bunch of lights or little little flames on, onto a bigger flame, is the understanding. So, you know, that's an introduction to the word powwow, really where it comes from. I could see the understanding, but Jennifer was saying about the, um, like how, how one says they dream in, a, in Ojibwe's powajigan. It means dream, to have a vision. So you see the beginning is the same, right? Powa, powajigan. And that's the journey of the smoke or the cloud and the manifestation of the creation, right? So there is some truth to the uh, archaeologists or anthropologists of who we are, but it's even more in depth to who we are in our journey. And everything has to happen in the spiral. Even saying the word dance in Ojibwe, nime, right, is a, still a smaller version of a bigger word. Like people say the word animki or nimkis, I mean thunder. The nime is the root word in it. It's the thunder that is dancing, and you're emulating the, your legs and your 
dance is like thunder dancing, creating the story of creation. So you're not only just honoring the land, you're honoring your own life when you do that dance. And that's how significant Pawo is. So, um, what is, I know a lot of people have this whole, um, always question pan indigenous when it comes to powwows. And so I guess what one question that's always been in my mind is how did the gathering of nations come to be? You can talk about that. <laughs> Jennifer will jump on that. Okay, all right, okay. <laughs> oh, but, yeah, and okay, go ahead, sorry. No, no, go ahead. Ask your question. We're going to do an interactive there. Yeah. <laughs> Bouncing between the two of us, this will be fun. From my understanding was, um, powwows was always like the first, the spring powwow sort of happened because everyone was sort of went off to their camps. And then spring powwow was, like, was the first time everyone had come together as a celebration. Then I don't know if that's a right teaching that I got or if that sort of oh. and also the the just the length any anything that then connects that the language understanding of well we already know that everything starts in the east right so the east is in parallel to um, uh, springtime so we say Wabanon right as the east Waba means to see or the light that is uh, the light over the shaking of the water Nung means the star, from the star in the east, or the light that is shaking. And it's a ceremony of, again, like Wa, you see Po Wa? So every time I say the word Wa, I'm referring to that circle of light, the continuity and the everlasting of our lives together within it. So, I mean, yeah, what you're saying <clears throat> holds merit, but it always begins in the east. So I don't know, I'm going to ask questions that Jennifer's going to touch on either, but... Um... Oh, sure, you can, we can bounce around in the linguistic if you, I like to view myself as the, the language tells me the instructions, right? I don't, don't make up the instructions. The, our ancestors created these word protocols and give you an ideology of the world view, right? You, you could never go beyond it or cre create it, it exists by itself, right? You know, that's why, you know, when you give the definition of both Kowagin and Kowajigan, I know that the word's parallel because I wrote, our language is compound to an idea that is systematically integrated together. So the 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 what we know as powwow now, it's the understanding hasn't changed, even in the modern form. That that now that the youth are sort of taken over and planning, do you find that it's shifting in regards to, or is that understanding of language still present? Well, the, the, the language is there. The functionality is the ceremony of your own journey. You're the journeyer, and you by dancing, you're not only honoring the land and the people around, you're honoring yourself, right? So if you don't, if you don't dance, because you, you're essentially dancing every day in your life, but you, if, when you conglomerate together in a powwow, you're reiterating that you can't do your journey alone, although you are on your own path, we have to work together, right? And sharing that, that circle together is an important part of that path. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, the language is very integrated. I mean, there's not, you know, there's no, it takes the guesswork out of it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that's why we, we, there's no discipline to it, because you're still on your own path, right? Yeah, okay. So everyone's connection to powwow, whether, is, is it the same for people who are indigenous and non-indigenous? Well, that's the point, right? Because yeah. even in the language, uh, you know, how a European concept is, they use the term Métis, right? Mm -hmm. In Ojibwe, proper Ojibwe, we would never call somebody a half group. It's impossible. Well, you could emulate a very slang version of it, but in proper traditional Ojibwe, you would never call somebody a half group. Either you are Anishinaabe Moet, or Anishinaabe, or you're not. It's the path in which you walk. So they didn't see color, they seen the path and, and the, the movement, because it's a verb-based language. The behavior in which you are is then what you become. 
it holds no uh, no face value to uh, to worry about color or race, except for your actions. Focus is on your actions, which is important, especially when you to sort of when you're coming to institutionalize institution yeah. powwows, because it's not just the indigenous students of the institution. It's the importance of them. We invite the entire institution, and they all come from all over the world. The earth flows a certain way and we all flow in that, that, that earth realm. And that's the bottom line, right? As long as you're you're flowing correctly into your path. You know, it doesn't say that we should all be like, you know, imitations of each other, but it does say that we, we should walk our own walk and make our own song and make our own vibration. There are some, you know, rhythms and rules to it, but those rules exist under the aspects of respect, respect to each other, right? <laughs> I can bring Jennifer back in so you can uh, finish up on your question okay. here. Yeah, and the, stay cool by. I'm pretty sure there'll be more questions uh, that you can. Oh, sure. <laughs> we'll, we'll play this back and forth. Then. Okay. Be <laughs> quiet. <laughs> and also, that was a great um, insight to the historical. Uh, yeah, it would be fantastic. Yes. <laughs> His um, like looking at the language and the philosophy and the instructions that are like held in the sounds uh, of the language was really pivotal for my dissertation. So I met Brian, you know, um, because I had asked him for for help with the language from his uh, ancient Ojibwe teaching page that he that he manages, or that you know that he owns. I don't know what he's, <laughs> how do you how do you say that? Yeah, I mean it's his. Blog. It's his personal blog. Oh, but awesome. yeah. So it, so it's it's amazing. So uh, just just to try to you know make sure the bridge is clear. The um, you know why we're looking at language and powwow and these definitions is framing like the uh, traditional Anishinaabe worldview, right? So as Brian mentioned, you know it's about it's about that that smoke and the sands and you know how all of that is in the language. Um, frames like how we approach dancing. Okay, so that um, is to understand why dance is, is really part of our culture and why, how it's like ingrained in us and why, why it's a big part of us. Um, because that is actually where the whole story of powwow starts. Okay. Um, because our, our culture was very much, uh, dance was ingrained, you know, we used it for, uh, for celebrations, um, not only when we came together, it was you know, very much for prayer. Um, and it was the, the one thing that, would, that after contact uh, scared the non, you know, the European settlers that, that came over. Um, because, you know, if you think about the time it was and, you know, contextualize how things kind of unfolded and, and evolved, um, you know, they, they had a very Christian background. So it was, um, the, the dancing was, was seen as a devil worship, right? So that is the reason, um, one of the main reasons that uh, dance was outlawed. So as, the, as Canada and the US were being settled, um, you know, there were laws and that you know, were put into place at different times that um, you know, were to uh, control the indigenous people, you know, to move us off our land. There's the, the Trail of Tears, there's the Move on Relocation Acts, and those sorts of things that, um, uh, you know, we're, we're pushing, we're repressing the dance and, and pushing people back. So, let's see, I can, I've got a bit of um, uh, a timeline, but I'll refer to some of my, some of my notes here. So, okay, we know, um, <clears throat> Um, that in, in the U.S., the settlement of the U.S. and the settlement of Canada, right, there are a lot of parallels because that, that was happening about the same time. And, you know, the U.S. Uh, formed quicker because the, the English, of course, had more of a, uh, they were more about colonizing and new lands and settling, whereas the French were more economic based, so they were more interested in, like, trading. So, um, so as the French were more involved with Canada, uh, the, the approach to the lands and the, and the people and the resources were initially different. 
Okay, so that uh, is probably one of the, the reasons that Canada kind of developed a little bit later, like after the US, um, you know, started introducing their policies, a lot of them run, do run parallel to how it happened in Canada. So, okay, we're talking about, um, you know, the US becoming a country in about 1776. And shortly thereafter, in like 1830, so we're, you know, only talk, we're talking around, you know, 50 years, um, they have the Indian Removal Act. So that was when the, that was um, moving uh, the indigenous people, you know, off the land. That's when the, the Trail of Tears is taking place during that time, this is 1838, the Trail of Tears is happening. Um, so there's a, this big push with the relocation to move the indigenous people um, west of the Mississippi River. You know, so they're um, pushing along um, and after what was happening is like, okay, after people were removed um, and the settlers kind of took over the East Coast, there became, became this, um, uh, you know, they, they were missing the indigenous people in a way there were, you know, Henry David Thoreau or Henry David Longfellow's uh, story, Song of Hiawatha and, you know, some other literary works came, uh, developed this idea of like the quote unquote noble savage. Okay, I don't know if that, if that is something that Canada learns in history. The noble savage, they know about that concept? Yes? Okay. I just want to be sure because like, you know, my education is all U.S. So, okay, so as they're being removed, there's this um, feeling, this longing for, oh, these poor Indians, it's not his fault, he's just, you know, the noble savage existing in this, you know, harsh, cruel wilderness. So they're, um, so it kind of built a longing in, in the, the people and the uh, settlers to, to see indigenous culture. So about this time, you know, uh, it, it's kind of this duality because at, at the same time, the, the people are longing for this uh, culture and, you know, missing the native people and they're kind of feeling guilty about what they've done to the government is still very much um, with the residential schools and relocation and the Indian wars. And, and that is what hap what's happening at the same time. But why that is important is because um, as it created this vacuum, um, it gave rise to, um, and, and circuses were coming up, but like this vacuum gave rise to people wanting to pay to see Indians, okay? So that is when uh, Buffalo Bill Cody, amongst others, but he is probably the most famous, famous one, um, you know, uh, recruited some dancers to be part of the, the Wild West show. So this is actually, um, let's see, um, in, the, in the same year that, uh, that dance was outlawed, um, 1838, uh, in the States, it was rules for Indian court saying that, that you know, it was punishable by imprisonment to, uh, you know, if you were dancing or doing ceremonies. That same year that, uh, in the, that was passed in the States it was when Buffalo Bill Cody hired uh, 38 show Indians. They were Pawnees from the, the West because remember uh, the indigenous people had been removed. So the frontier was out in the West. So, the, so those were people who were still very much, you know, practicing their way of life and their culture, you know. So when Wild Bill, he recruited those people and that is what he, that is the culture and those are the people that he put on tour, right? So when people would pay to come to these shows and see not only celebrities, but you know, these, these very theatrically orchestrated uh, raids with, with all of the, um, you know, the, that, that fear narrative, you know, that, so that white audiences could come see this, this uh, fantastic Wild West show but they were safe, right? Because the Indians weren't coming to attack them. They weren't going to, you know, their their life, their village, their homes weren't in danger. But they could see it in the show, and it still had that um, that that uh, thrill and that fear. So the Wild West shows are, are um, you know, came up in that time during that time, and uh, you know, because but because. Buffalo Bill toward the Plains cultures, that's what became the stereotypical um, 
understanding our idea of of Indian, of native culture, right? Of, all, of the indigenous culture. So when you think about that, that that is um, uh, how modern powwow, a lot of the dances are very plains influences. When you look at the women's traditional, uh, you know, that long fringe and all that, that's not a Nishnabe. Uh, there's, there's actually a, a push taking place to bring back the strap dresses, the strap dresses with the detachable sleeves, which were the uh, Anishinaabe traditional dress. Um, so when you go to go to powwows and you see, you know, the women's traditional wear the, the long fringe that doesn't belong to us. That that was never our way, um, but that is what has been was seen and has been adopted. Um, another thing that that was happening with the Wild West shows that were like uh, pivotal is that culture was hidden in plain sight. Right, so this, what's happening is we're, um, the dances are, are outlawed and it's outlawed on the reservation, we're not allowed to gather, but we're allowed to put on regalia and perform for white audiences. You know, whether it is a ribbon cutting for a bank opening or something, at, at, you know, during that time. You know, so they, it, we were convenient, right, when they, they wanted a, a little pop of color then, you know they would look to their indigenous neighbors. So, so what was happening with, with this, um, uh, of, you know, even during, let's see, let me check the year. Um, 1893, the Columbian Exhibition in Chicago. It was, it's, it was um, I think it was also called the World's Fair. It was like a very big fair. Uh, but there's a record of them doing um, a, uh, I think it was a, I think it was a dog feast, actually. You know, so there, so uh, they were doing the ceremony to bring the game back. I think there was a dog feast, and there were there was something else that was happening that took them a while to get off the, uh, their supplies. But so they did this ceremony for themselves, for like what, you know, to for tradition and and belief. Um, but it was under the guise of like performing for for an audience. Right, so so it had that that dual meaning. People thought they were just watching something and being being entertained, but the the people who were participating, you know, were, were passing that ceremony among the other other cultures who by that time had all come together to be part of this Wild West show. So, um, I think that 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 is um, you know where a lot a lot of that that comes from. Uh, you know, during this time we also had. Uh, you know, when you look at how society started changing, too. So, you know, the the wars happened: World War One, World War Two, and um, uh, you know, in the states, John Collier was appointed Indian commissioner, so he lifted the ban on on dancing. So there was a little bit, you know, it's almost like like a, a not a softening, but but they were relaxing just just a bit, you know. Some things had had died down with the wars going on out in the, the plains, and you know, so there was like there was more dancing and more gathering, and uh, so that's so after the world wars are usually when there, there were powwows to like welcome the warriors back, right? They were welcoming people back to the community, and that's where we see a lot of the dances actually uh, changing. So I can tell you a little bit about the the dances, but that's just some some of the history to contextualize how powwow came to be. We weren't allowed to dance. It all kind of like went underground. Then we were allowed to dance and we were, had culture from the, the plains brought in. And that's that's kind of where, where that, that was. So in uh, with the World Wars, I know it's gonna be edited, so let me check for sure. Yes, it was a dog, it was a dog ceremony. It was indeed. Okay, so like in Canada, uh, the dance restriction remained on the books and it wasn't repealed until 1951. So in the grand scheme of things when, you know, 1951 wasn't that long ago, that's, that's like in my father's lifetime. Um, you know, when dance and ceremonies, when we are once again allowed to practice, you know, without fear of imprisonment or punishment of, of some way. Um, because at this, at that point, dance and ceremonies had been like, you know, quote unquote, discouraged for over a hundred years. 
So that is at least a generation and a half or, or two. And it had been actually outlawed for 66 years. Wow. So just to kind of give a frame of, of reference for you know, the, the length of time we're looking at for when we, we weren't allowed to, we weren't able to, to practice openly. So, uh, so what was happening during the world, world wars? People were coming back. Um, that's when some of the dances were cha changing. I can talk about those in a minute. Um, you know, but the bit, really big push for modern powwow um, happened in the um, in about the, the 60s. What, what started happening in society, um, you know, after there's the wars, you think about how like society was changing, right? I mean, there was still quite a bit of oppression. There was a lot of racial tension, racial injustice, segregation, all of that that, that was like still in play. So you have the, the wave of like the, the second wave feminist movement, you have um, the civil rights, um, marches, you have Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. So these are, you know, the changes that are taking place in society that again are like creating space for um, indigenous voices to, to come in and be heard. So while the, um, while the um, uh, civil rights movement was, was taking place, um, that's when the American Indian movement came up in the U.S. So the Air American Indian movement was very much about, you know, reclaiming indigenous rights. It was in the, the same kind of vein as like the Black Panthers. You know, we were looking at, uh, you know, racial change in, in the U.S. And during that time, um, AIM uh, had spiritual leaders as well as, um, you know, the activists. So they, they were somewhat spiritually uh, established and that and you know the, that's when like the powwows were encouraged and that gathering was was starting to, to come up so you know, it was a really big push um, that that happened and that was in the 1960s until about the 1980s so modern powwow uh, you know coming up from from that era and also from from the plains culture and from, from being hidden and then being brought back out you know all of these these factors and are going in to create powwow that, you know, as we experience it today. So all, while all of these things are going on, it's changing the dances, right? It's also changing our expression of, of uh, you know, our, of our culture. So, and just for a small frame of reference, um, uh, with Wamakong powwow has only been going on, the, like their first powwow was, well, and it wasn't even called a powwow then. This is like 1961. So, you know, we're, we're just uh, barely over 50 years uh, with that. And it, and it was called um, uh, Indian Days. And it was put on with the guys of like, you know, the people would, would dance on the stage and it was very much set up for a white, for a white audience. And I can get you a picture of that that they might want to show. Okay. So I'll talk a little bit about the dances and how it relates to the to that historical orientation, you know, just to give you an idea. Okay. Oh, so one of the questions was about about um, uh, from the Wild West show. Yeah. Uh, that's where like rodeo and powwow kind of like split off. Of oh, they have that that common beginning with the Wild West show, and that is also. Um, one version of where our grand entry came from uh, was that big parade when when they would come in. Okay. Okay. So you would say that a lot of um, Western influences have structured how powwows are today, or is it still under the guidance of our teachings of, or is it, or is it pan indigenous pan indigenous? <laughs> well, well, we can talk about pan indigenous pan indigeneity. Okay, so yes, a bit of what what has happened with powwow, um, and this is, we'll talk about it now. But they might want to put this this section at the end. Yeah, okay. there, you know, because pan indigeneity, yes, was a really big uh, question because because we're using the plains dances more or less, that it's like, okay, so everybody dances one of three styles, but we are all 
from you know different areas and nations and and uh, and backgrounds. And you know, and as I have mentioned, like you know the powwow general traditional style is, is very plains and you know that it, it doesn't relate to um, our culture as a Anishinaabe up here. So I, yes, I think there is a bit of pan-indigeneity, but I think that, that uh, or from what I have seen, uh, that there is a there is a push to reclaim it. Like we see more of the woodland style dancing now. Uh, we're beginning to see more of the strap dresses with the detachable sleeves. Um, so, so I think it has been part of the progression where we've had to, to um, you know, reawaken our identity through powwow being a way that we could participate. But then it led us to larger questions about our own, our own identity and, you know, who we are, you know, uh, when we come together in that, that social aspect and when we come together, uh, you know, and kick those sands. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, just to give you a, a, a bit of bit of an overview of background about where s some of the dances come from, it, that also do, relates to that uh, uh, pan pan indigeneity too. Is that you know they were being like shared shared and traded, right? The the dances and the like the the fancy dance that we know the men's fancy dance with the two two bustles actually came from the Wild West show that that um, they were, the dancers were asked to fancy up their dancing because they didn't dance like the white audiences were expecting, right? The white audiences wanted to see whooping, hollering, war, you know, people on the war path, you know, this whole, whole construction. Um, so, you know, Buffalo Bill had asked them to dance more like what was being expected. So that's where that double bustle uh, came from. Um, and then like after, uh, World War II, uh, the men's traditional that we know with like the single bustle actually came from from uh, Oklahoma. And that made its way from Oklahoma, you know, up to the plains. And then it, I think it, it um, appeared in the, the Great Lakes area around like 1950. Uh, what was also happening, they gave a, for a bit of historical context that the U.S had um, the Indian Relocation Act. It was a second, it was a second act, and that was um, 1956. And what that did was uh, it, it took indigenous people, uh, it encouraged them to leave the reserves and move to the big cities. So how they did that was that they would um, lose their federal recognition as a, as a tribe. So reservations were being disbanded and, uh, and taken away. And then they would encourage people to move to the cities by paying their relocation and also paying them for uh, uh, like vocational training. So as people left the, re the reservations, you know, they're coming from all different parts of the, the country to large cities like Chicago, uh, Minneapolis, um, you know, and they're bringing all the, the dances with them, right? So this is when, this is how the dances are traveling from you know, uh, into the cities from the reservations as they, they're like passed over time. Uh, so that is, um, uh, let's see, okay. Because we're really, we're really gonna have a chat about jingle dress too. Uh, okay, so, okay, men's fancy bustle. Yep, that's relatively new. Um, another one that is, is, um, uh, that is like really new is the, of course the fancy shawl dance. Um, the fancy shawl dance appear, first appeared around the 1940s. So what that is right after World War II. So when you think about what is changing in society uh, after World War II. The, when the war started, uh, you know, the men went to war and the women had like, you know, Rosie the Riveter and they were doing the, the um, you know, the working in the factories, making the ammunition, keeping the country going while the men were, were at war, right? While the men came home and a lot of the women didn't want to give up, uh, you know, now they had their own money, they were driving cars, they, you know, didn't have to just be in, in the home. So there was a bit of, of a change that way, you know, or uh, that, that that gave rise to the feminist move, movement happening in the 60s. Yeah, it's all kind of like interconnected. 
Um, so in the 40s is when the fancy shawl dance um, first started appearing. And it came out of, uh, you know, women being frustrated with the, the men's dance. Because when, at that time in powwow, when you come together, there was just like one style of dance for, for women. So the fancy shawl was, was uh, it wasn't fancy shawl at the time, it was done as like an exhibition where the women most often were, you know, they'd play a fast song, their feet would just fly, they'd stop with their feet together at the end. It wasn't high, there wasn't spinning, it wasn't, it was danced mostly in place. So it was like a very old, um, you know, it was like, like a special. It's like, okay, now we're going to do, do this. And uh, so that, I think, parallels the the change in you know like women asserting themselves more that it that you know we had that um that voice and that ability was starting to to come up from changes in society so the fancy shawl dance um you know had traveled in a similar way where it was first starting to appear it wasn't always um accepted it wasn't always popular but it started building momentum. And then by the time we had that relocation act that put everybody into the cities, the dance was, it was around the 60s. So that's when the dance was becoming more popular. You have this push from the American Indian movement that is uh, supporting a reclamation of identity and, and strength and culture. And that just kind of like, you know, gave those dances a boost. So that and that's the, seems to be the most popular um, choice of dance now through, through the young. Yeah, it it is. Um, you know, then then there, of course, a discussion about jingle dance, and jingle is is probably the um, probably the primary example, just to show how that dance and spirit and all is is connected. You know, I mean, bringing it back to the, bringing it back to uh, Brian's talk about like powwow and, and the, the kicking of the sands and what, what powwow means and how it's related to smoke and related to dreams. Um, we have that in the jingle dress, right? That, that's probably the tightest connection that we have right now to understand that, that, uh, that part. So the jingle dance, of course, uh, many, many stories about like origins. The dance is um, pro probably didn't or originate with Maggie White. It's probably an old dance that's been around for a long time because there it was a healing dance that used shells. But I, um, but I believe Maggie White's, uh, the, when, that, when it was used uh, for her, when her father had the dream and the dance was used for her healing, I think that was the push that kind of like reignited the jingle dress as a, a healing dance. And one of the things that is, um, uh, that I find, okay, the, the jingle dance, so it appeared in Anishinaabe country, but it, it wasn't even mainstream until, you know, like the 60s, 70s. Um, and I, I have uh, counts you know, from people from like the first time they saw it and that was like in the in the seventies. So it's not a, a dance that's been in in the powwow for, for a long time. Um, but what's really important to know about about the jingle da dance or what is important to, to think about, you know, maybe with the jingle dance as an example, is that powwow and dance and our connection to prayer and spirit, that that jingle dress dance when it came from uh, Maggie White's father, uh, was given from spirit. Spirit showed him how to dance, what the regalia looked like, and what the songs were. So it is hard for me sometimes to watch contemporary jingle dancers because yes, culture grows and changes, but when we have direction from spirit, you know, with a very specific intention, um, I hesitate to um, to want to deviate from that. You know, I mean, who are we to change change that? Mm -hmm. So, and to add a bit more about jingle dress, I'd like to bring Brian can tell you about the spiritual significance um, with the uh, with the jingles. 
This is that welcome back moment there. <laughs> Bonjour, mes noirs. Hello again. Hello. <laughs> okay. So the significance of the Amegis shell, as you would know it, or the Crowley shell, as history has written it, is like when young ladies, uh, before their time of menstruation, their moon cycle, they are only allowed a maximum of 13 shells. And the, the understanding and the teaching behind it is that the 13 shells represented the 13 moons, right? Because she wasn't menstruating yet, so she didn't have that uh, the ability or the bull of creation. Whereas when you say a uh, boy and girl in the language, you say guisance for boy, quesance for girl. You, you, they're pretty much the same word, but one is accent with the G sound, the other one's a K sound. Because in, in times of old, the children didn't really, they're kind of genderless, right? They were just beings, I think. And when you even add the word zance at the end, you're just saying like little little woman or little, little person, okay? So when that, that young lady then had her time of menstruation, she moved beyond having a 13 shell or just like the, the, the 13 shell origin, you know, before it even landed on the woman, came from the shell of the turtle, the mechanic, right? The mechanic back had the 13 chevrons, which represented the 13 times of our moon. And you know, we have 13 moons in our Ojibwe calendar and each cycle of the moon is always 28. And we always had a 364 day calendar. So that emblematic repetitiveness was into the child or the young ladies with the 13. As she became a mother or not even just a mother or a, a woman, right? A bowl carrier of water of creation because a man is external bowl carrier, a woman is internal, right? She carries the bowl internal. He is just a manifestation external on, on the surface, right? Every time she gained knowledge in her, her path, she basically gained a new media shell because each media shell, even when you do the ceremony of the water drum, you blow into the shell. It's the Naba or Opan, as they call the lung, the breath of life, the spitting through it to give life to creation. So that was that repetitiveness. So it's like, uh, not, it's a personal journey, but it was a journey for each woman to say, well, I have this knowledge of medicines and, and different attributes. And it's up for the carrier, the dancer, because you're really, again, dancing your own life to explain the story of knowledge. And that's how you would carry that knowledge. And that's why today they still use it as that breath of life. So every exchange at one time, we used to trade with Mija shells, right? That was considered one breath or one life. So you understood the value of life and as a creator, a woman creator, later after the 13, you were, uh, you know, this was your exchange. I could give you, I could offer you two breaths of life for this exchange, right? Because there was no money value on it. Life, the, the breath of life is the value of life. Right? It's the only currency we have. I hope that kind of gives you a logist of where it comes from. Right? Yeah, <laughs> it's good. Uh, well, the cones, yeah, we can talk about the, the cones. So, how, uh, like you have a cone, right? So like the Thunderbird, Benessi, or Thunder Beans, Benessio, as it's pronounced, it talks about the tornadoes and the lightning and the, you know, the wings of the Thunderbird, which is the clouds. So each cone, like when a woman dances, you have the down cone, right? As you see it, and you have the up cone. So that's that bowl that you, you know, that a woman carries internally. So she carries that bowl of creation. So like north to south, right? Up and down. She's like uh, a magnet, right? She's charging that up. And uh, the Ojibwe expression is, uh, like you as a woman, even the word Ojibwe is, Oji Jibwa Kwe, means that you are a regenerator, immortal, immortal being. So your mother can regenerate. That's why you say the expression Jibwa Kwe to cook. But Oji Jibwa Kwe means that your mom is regenerating, re-energizing life. And that goes back to that jingle that she's healing by giving it energy, giving it form. And those expressions are reiterated by using the jingle today. And that's why they specifically put it as a cone shape, because when water drains on the, on the this world level, it drains in a spiral. When it comes from the sky, it's the opposite spiral. It comes down as a tornado, but everything's inverted, it comes back and forth, right? And you'll see there's teachings of the up and down. Later, they, you know, when they go calm, they, they express it as clowns, but it's not the clowns are tricksters, it's just there's a, 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 a mirrored world, right? The up and down world. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. Any questions on that? Uh, no, I think it's pretty 
I can't think of any. <laughs> it's pretty. It's pretty thorough. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Well, like I said, the language tells you everything. It gives you the rules. The rules are that you know, you're on your own path. There is. It's not like a science, right? It tells you the elements of what's there, what you can do. You know, if you've crossed the line, if you haven't crossed the line. But the bottom line is that respectful line, right? Even when we say unconditional love, Rao Manang, right? You know, Jibwe, we use that expression. Some others don't as often. It's a sign of compassion or pity because it's against the rules for us to force our will onto another. Even if you're failing and you're falling and you're hurting, out of love, we would let you fall so you can experience that and become a better person, you know? That's still a form of love, right? Unless, it, you're, you know, we give you some pity and we're like, well, okay, well, we'll feed you because it's still customary that we feed you, you know, but we wouldn't do the work for you, right? Because that's your journey. Why would we take away your uh, chance to experience personal growth? Mm -hmm. that's, an, then that's an important lesson for people who to sort of tie back to those who are organizing powwows or participating powwows or even just volunteering because there's always this and this um, need for everything needs to run perfectly everything needs, needs to go great like there should be no hiccups and then when I was planning the power and I'm like everything's gonna happen the way it's supposed to happen so if there's an error it's something that we learned in the, and there was errors in the first power that I helped organize and, was, and that's those are lessons we learned as a team of all the organizers to sort of say now next year this is what we're gonna do so you can't plan that you can plan for errors but there's an error is going to happen, but it may be, you may not be prepared for it. So it's a matter of just saying that everything be will be and it's a lesson learned. Well, that's it, right? And, you know, and even when we do ceremonies and we're creating lodges and everything, the rule number one is always laugh, always be happy, don't be angry, you know, don't speak harsh words. Because the power that's within it is the, the, is the gentle nature of accepting what comes before you. And you're allowed to have mistakes. The perfection is only up to you. I mean, it's a, an ever-growing perfection, right? We'll never be able to achieve it because it's supposed to evolve, right? You know? So having those mistakes gives it character, it gives it story, and it makes us a better person in the end. You know, the worst of us who've experienced the worst of journeys can be the wisest if they can survive it because they'll have so much knowledge to share just in their story, you know? So true. I think more people need to hear that as well. <laughs> <laughs> and understand that yeah that's it like that's why we, we say humility right yes how can you be above somebody because we're still our own you know path right? mm -hmm. even when we say Bamad Zwin that's the life Zwin is the path you're on your path I'm on my path how can I say that yours is better than mine how can nobody is better it's just what we what we make out of it right mm -hmm. you know as long as I I don't teach you as long as I example my way, you'll learn, hmm. right? Yes. If we can only example to each other. Yes, so true. Thank you. <laughs> That's amazing. I'll bring you back, Jennifer. There. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. No. So I think we're coming up to tying everything to the end. So, yes. what word did you want to cover in this last little bit? <laughs> No, I did just want to want to connect the dots to bring, mm -hmm. bring it all together, okay. uh, as we said. Uh, so the the takeaway from this this part, you know, in regalia and the connection to spirit, is that there there is more to the dances, and there's more to regalia than what people just come and see at, at powwow. I think there we have seen also seen that there is quite a duality. Um, people who, who don't know and don't have cultural background, who are just learning and reclaiming their culture, um, you know, come and, and dance and experience it in a way that, that uh, creates that, that gateway for learning. Um, you know, and since everyone is on their path, you know, they, they might may not ever uh, be interested or know like the, the full spiritual part of, of the dances. Um, but it's also 
you know, with the thing about pan indigeneity and like what are what's in the dances, you know, and how do we just just take a dance for its surface value and you know dance it in a social setting? Um, I, I hope that people think more about their connection to like their own path and spirit and uh, and the dances, you know, as that that comes together in their own lives. So it's just um, you know that cir circular, you know, we're back to completing the circle. So just a, um, so what do you think is what importance do these urban and institutional powwows play in the role of community? Well, community is is uh, defined so many different ways, right? I mean, we're we're all parts of different communities, whether it's like our family and uh, you know reserves, or uh, you know our school community, or like even being like in in Toronto, there's an indigenous community here that are all interwoven and all overlap. And I think the the big importance with the university powwows is that it um, allows the indigenous people a voice. It allows us to be seen and heard, and there's an opportunity created there for the students to um, reclaim their identity, question who they are, and also bring you know that growth and that development uh, you know to the surface at the university at, at that time in their lives. Mm -hmm. and, that's, and that's specifically the reason why I, as an indigenous student at an institution at University of Toronto, where um, I came, I became uh, executive member of, of an indigenous studies student union at U of T, and so many students had come to me and said, "U of T never had a power. Why? How come we've never had a power?" And I was like, "I'm like, well, now that I'm in this position, I'm going to do what I can because even as a student, walking." through the campus, I never saw myself reflected. I never felt that that I, where I was, like, yes, there's um, a First Nations house and you have Indigenous studies, but what sort of let everyone else know Indigenous grad students existed at the university? And that at that point, I find that U of T, the greater student body, didn't understand that there were Indigenous students and graduate students and graduate programs and then so that's why when I took the initiative to sort of say okay, hey put it together and created that community and it was non-indigenous and indigenous students to sort of put it all together and now that it's sort of become a staple and that's sort of I'm not saying that's and I don't want it to be something like that's known as my legacy I don't want it to be like this is something that the students have always wanted and it's there. Now it's always sort of been the seed was planted what, three years ago. Now it's just gonna, it's just gonna hopefully grow big as I know some institutions south of the border where their powers are massive. And I find U of T's powwow and also Ryerson's, they had, I remember they had a powwow back 20, 15 years ago, and then it sort of dissipated, like it sort of disappeared. And I know Riley and Laura were the first to sort of reignite that and bring it back to Ryerson. And just what that does for an institution for graduate students, it's just so important. And, and I love how you said how the community, it brings those communities together, because especially with the non-Indigenous and Indigenous students that are part of these institutions. And well, sure. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, well, part of that conversation too, becomes like, you know, like where where were the numbers of indigenous people in the universities, right? And who was putting on on the powwows? You know, like 20 years ago, was it done for like recruitment or uh, in the states there's a lot of ho hobbyist powwows that's put on by the Boy Scouts or by like the anthropology department or you know like like at, at that time it wasn't like a like a real authentic powwow, um, and now you know powwow is is. You know, uh, powwow is seen as a draw to get Indigenous students to come to the university. It's like, you know, here we we can support you. We we're culturally, you know, aware. You know, there there are other people here. There's there's community here. So you know, like, come join us. Uh, so I think that's another, you know, function of powwow at at the universities. 
And my experience from teaching a, a course at Queens, I taught a powwow course there. Um, and I also, um, you know, it was with, you know, Queens is, is like, you know, predominantly non-indigenous, of course. Um, but by the end of my course, people were, were um, you know, either identifying or, um, uh, or like one of my students had actually talked about her uncle who was 60 scoop, but she was a, a settler family that had adopted a, a native child. Right. So it was really the first time that I that, you know, this this kind of woke her up to where her family fit in the, you know, in the, in the discussion of like history and culture and, you know, and powwow and community and and that. So, I mean, you don't know where people are, are coming from, um, but university is is really the, the time when when they start becoming a little bit more aware and questioning. Mm -hmm. I always wonder what the what after an institution has a powwow, what are the, like, what are the numbers prior to the powwow in regards to indigenous enrollment and after when it mm -hmm. becomes known? Like, uh, I want, yeah. like, it's easy to do that research, like maybe research yeah. you can do <laughs> to sort of see like what's the uh, genre. And, then, and for me, it's important to let specifically indigenous youth know that this is, this is available to you when you come here or wherever you choose to go because it's important that we draw those the younger generations mm -hmm. to higher education mm -hmm. because because it, it wasn't like when I was in my when I was 19 18 19 whenever you're supposed to go to university I was told I couldn't nor nor was anyone trying to recruit me either mm -hmm. so I find now it's more like no one wants to draw in those indigenous students. Well, what's interesting too is that when you go to bigger powwows, um, you see re you see universities recruiting right there. I mean, there'll be a whole section of like you know where the different universities set up, as well as like you know the army and uh, army and and uh, you know other um, armed forces, um, police recruit to it at powwows and and things like that. So um, I think I think there's more of a push. Now, like you never saw that, um, you know, 20 years ago, you, you didn't really see universities recruiting at powwows, but, you know, but it, it is changing. There are a lot more indigenous people in university now. Um, I mean, even just the way that like indigenous research methods have become more, uh, more available and more accepted by the academy, um, you know, that encourages, you know, it makes place in the universities for our language, for our languages, for our worldviews, for our ways of knowing, you know, to be held within these institutions that, um, that make it easier um, and more, you know, like, like friendlier, you know, more accessible for, for people to come in and fit because their, their knowledges are, are uh, valued too. So I think that had to change. To, to get more people to, to get more indigenous people to come. The universities had to, to change. Mm -hmm. Yes. And even like you're trying to draw people from other parts of the world, you need to draw people in who are local too. <laughs> yes. People the indigenous people of the land, of your territory that your institutions laid upon, invite them in as well. Well, I'm very proud of Ryerson. And in that regard, um, because when I am a recent recruit at Ryerson, I started in June, no, I started in July, July 1st. And one of the, the big things at Ryerson, you know, they, they're hiring more indigenous faculty. There is a really big push for working with the community and for, um, you know, bringing, bringing those, uh, those knowledges in. And, you know, being in Toronto, we have such a, um, such a rich, diverse tapestry of an indigenous knowledge here that it's uh, really inspiring that Ryerson is uh, is pursuing that and taking advantage of, of, of being here. And it's important work for institutions to continue doing that because it's important for students like myself or generations younger than me. So when they come into the institutions, they see themselves reflected mm. in the faculty on materials on campus, <laughs> you know. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I did my my undergrad 
at Northern Illinois University. And uh, we hosted our first powwow there. I was like, you know, one of like four indigenous students in, in a very large university. Uh, and we had, you know, one uh, faculty advisor who wasn't even indigenous, you know, for, for the first part of our um, journey. And, uh, you know, and eventually and we, we did have a powwow by my seat. It took, it took us like three years because we had to explain to people what it was, tell them why it was a good idea, try to find funding, try to get people on board. You know, it was just like a lot of bureaucratic red tape to, you know, finally make it, make it happen. And it was really important to us. There was a, a cafe called Powwow Cafe. So we were like trying to get the name changed and then show like what a real powwow is and what it was all about. And, um, you know, so I, I understand the, I, I feel that parallel, like with, with U of T and Ryerson, like even if they had power before and didn't have it, you know, but starting it now, I mean, this is this is your generation. You know, this is like recent, this is a history, this is what, what has been fought. And, you know, what, what you've gone through now, you know, to get the powwows going and things, you know, we, we recognize a need, right, at all stages of, of that all stages of that development you know at different times we've all said hey we need this we're leaving at we need this we'll leave it at there this is, we'll say that to be the last word of this okay. this interview and that's amazing it's true whatever regards just to sum it all up from the historical aspects of the language that comes into powwow and the historical aspect of uh, this historical significance of the dancing of thing and the reclaiming of students bringing powers back to these institutions and it's just important that it all ties down to we need this mm -hmm. something this is us we need this and, and that's important of tying it all up and just we need it because this is who we are <laughs> thank you jennifer for your time for doing this and the information you shared it's it's very important and i hope everyone takes the time to sit and listen to the information that was shared by you and brian and they sort of take it on and learn and find other ways of incorporating what you taught into possibly constructing their own powwows in their communities or in their institutions or wherever it is even in their workplaces, we need to have a small one, do a small one, but uh, thank you again. And oh, my pleasure. I hope our conversation today inspires deeper thought as people explore powwow and their identity. Well, it was my pleasure to be a, a guest today and thank you, Jennifer, for a wonderful morning. Oh, yes, it was great. So, miigwech. Miigwech. Bamati. Bamati. Mm -hmm.